Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have today governmental accounting essentials uh, from folks from the New York State Government Accounting Essentials. And um, I'm going to let them introduce themselves and we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maura Ryan, and I'm the executive director of the New York Government Finance Officers Association. And I want to thank Sarah Pearson and the Southern Tier West Local Government Conference for inviting GFOA to be part of your program today. And thank you all for attending today's program. We have two of our best speakers, very experienced CPAs on board with us today, and they're going to do an excellent job. And we encourage you to ask questions and please participate fully. You'll get more out of it and it'll be enjoyable for everyone. So I'd like to turn this over to Barb Smith, who is one of our presenters. She's a CPA, SBA, and SDA school administrator for the Gowanda School District, and John Savash, CPA, Associate Professor of Accounting from Elmira College. Thank you and enjoy. Thanks, Maura. I'll just um, give you a little bit more information about myself. I am originally from Randolph. And then I went to UB uh, to, for accounting. And then I was one of those mean OSC auditors for four years. And then I went back into public accounting for four years where I got my CPA license. And then I was for the Buffalo Public Schools, I was their chief financial officer. I was there for a total of 12 years. The last six is their chief financial officer. And then I got the itch to kind of come back toward home. And I moved back to my family farm in Randolph. And I had a consulting business for three years until I, I kind of found um, a little home here in Gowanda as their business official. Um, a very interesting school district, um, happy to be close to home and happy to still be able to kind of do some of these presentations. Um, I, I've always enjoyed kind of teaching governmental accounting. It's very different and unique. Um, so hopefully if you get something on the program, if you ever have any questions, please chime in and let us know if you have questions during the program. Um, John, you want to say something about yourself as well? Absolutely. Uh, I'm, I'm originally from um, Depew, New York, which is a, a suburb of um, Buffalo. Uh, grew up, I play, I went to Canisius College and uh, I got my bachelor's degree in accounting. Worked uh, for years in um, public accounting for um, BDO Seedman. And actually I was in, my expertise was in um, tax, primarily um, corporations, partnerships, as corporations. And then um, I left and I went to, um, for my MBA in finance, I, I went to Ohio University and um, I got involved with teaching down there. And I had a professor who uh, taught government accounting and I took it as an elective class and I really liked it. I stayed um, down in Ohio and I taught at both Ohio uh, University and uh, Miami University for uh, five years. And then I got a phone call from my hometown, the village of Depew, needing um, a treasurer. So I moved back home and I was the treasurer of the village of Depew for um, three and a half years before um, uh, taking a job teaching again. And I moved to um, Elmira and I've been at Elmira College for 23 years. But I also started a consulting practice about 17 years ago. So I do a lot of work with um, small towns and villages on a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, you know, um, basic accounting stuff. Um, I also do some system uh, setup. Uh, primarily QuickBooks, Williamson Law Book, Capital Project work. So I teach it, but I'm also out there doing it for a lot of the smaller communities. So, and I'm excited about also being a presenter today. So welcome everybody. Thanks, Jen. Um, just to kind of get us started and to help us kind of know, um, you know, what everybody, where everybody kind of is on the spectrum of government accounting. If you wouldn't mind just putting kind of in the chat box, you know, what your experience is. Is it minimal with government accounting? Is it extensive? Um, are you brand new to it? Um, if you just wanted to chime in on the chat box, it would kind of help us try to gauge our presentation to you. I 
don't see any responses. Anyone? Oh, there's one. Yep, got one. Great. Thank you, Amber. Okay, great. All right, so we will try and give you kind of just some, we'll start with the simplest forms of some of the way that um, the government accounts work. Um, and as we get going, if you want to, um, if you have questions, like I said, chime in. So basically, when you think of accounts, um, it's really just a formal record, record um, to be able to kind of keep track of everything that's going on. So you're going to have your increases, your decreases, um, and you want to be able to look at an account and know by the number and name of it what it is that you're trying to track. So when we look at government accounting in particular, the nice thing about government accounting is it's, it's pretty standardized when we talk about um, the way that the account codes are set up. So the state controller's office has basically come out um, and they have built, they give you the guidelines of what your fund, your balance sheet, all of your accounts, no matter what type, type of government you're looking at, they're all basically the same so that you can compare um, across, across both um, your peer group but you can also then be able to look at, if I work for a school district, I know I can go to a county and they'll have the same kind of account code set up. Um, so it, it is nice that it's standardized that way. Um, it allows for kind of quick recording of transactions and definitely consisting of, of consistent reporting across the state. The state collects that data um, for school districts. Like we all have to file what we call, um, we use the stamp system to upload basically our financials into the database um, that the state holds. And that's really true of counties, villages, and everyone. You all have to file your annual reports and then the state can collect that so that they have all of that data to be able to compare across the state and the different type of governmental units. So when we look at the account codes themselves, they're gonna consist of um, a letter, which will be your fund, and then the different types of numbers, depending on whether it's an asset, a liability, a revenue, or an expenditure. When you look at um, governments, general fund is always going to be the A fund. Um, that's true no matter what. Um, we do have here one of the, the, the two links that we have, you'll be able to go to at any point in time. Um, this is the New York State Accounting and Reporting Manual that I have up here. Um, this is really nice. It does go through. Um, I've always found this very handy, especially for new board members or as a new person coming into governmental accounting. The way that it identifies which funds um, you'll use in a specific district, and it also will go through and identifies, and we have some of these in the presentation, um, but the different groupings of your revenue sources, your expenditure sources, it will give you um, a breakdown of all of the different types of accounts. Um, that is very handy. Um, again, particularly if you're new, I would encourage you to kind of look at that, um, get accustomed to how the accounts are organized. And the other very nice thing um, for the accounts is the chart of accounts query at the state controller's office. So you can go in and kind of pick your year, what type of um, governmental unit you are, and then look for the different types of accounts that are, are set up there. Um, so, and a lot of times, sometimes what you'll find is, um, I always used to use this when I was auditing, is I might get a purchase order and someone might want to know what account code I should use. Is it for curriculum? Is it for Department of Public Works? Is it for water? You want to know what the item is for and what the cost is going to be for, and then you can determine which account you want to use. So I always like to look at kind of the list of accounts to see what my options are. And I'm sure I show my screen here from where I'm at. Um, so it makes a nice way to be able to look up all of your um, options up to where you basically kind of want to put your uh, expenditures and stuff. Yeah, the query the query is great. Um, I use it a lot too. I'm also the um, bookkeeper in the town of Corny, and um, it's really handy if. Uh, you're um you're doing uh something and you need a new account 
and you're not really familiar with that account, you can go to the query and you look it up by um, type of fund and then it'll give you the list and then you can just uh, use that and enter it in your accounting system. And I know that some of you based upon uh, the chat box, some of you may, may be less interested in the accounting side of things and more interested in um, you're going to get a monthly budget and you're not sure um, the budget to actual you're not sure how to read it. So this is very helpful if you're not familiar with the accounts to review this. So because as um, Barb said, uh, every town really uses the same accounts. Every village really uses the same accounts. Every school district really uses the same accounts. The state has tried to make this uh, very easy for, um, for municipalities in New York State. So these are um, very useful uh, links for all of you. Thanks, Jen. So in our kind of our standardized set of account codes, the 100 to 499 will always be your assets. When you think about your balance sheet, you're gonna have your assets, your liabilities, and your fund equity. And then your 600 accounts are your liabilities and 800 to 999 are fund equity. So in this case, you know, A200 is always gonna be your general fund cash. In all of those state reports across the line, A200 should just be your general fund cash. When it comes to the revenue accounts, um, same type of, of scheme. They're always their four digits. And then within your own accounting system, I will say you can have more than four digits. So for example, we have state uh, general aid, but then there's a piece of general aid that has is kind of a set aside of that. So we might have 3001 is our general aid, but 3001, 3001.001 is excess costs. So you can, within your own accounting system, you might find that you have more than just these four digits, but the beginning section of these four digits are always gonna mean the same thing. So your local sources, your state sources are always in your 3000s, your federal sources are always in your 4000s, and then you have your other, your inner fund and, and uh, debt in your 5000s. Expenditures, same thing. Um, we have these four digits represent the function and then we're gonna get into the object. So you're gonna have, if you always have your fund, your function, your object. Um, within that same concept, it, within your actual accounting system, you may have other digits that mean something. So location, um, or you might have an extension or it's a grant. Sometimes you take these digits and you add something onto them. But the same concept is that they're always gonna be, these are your major function of categories. Um, and then what you'll find is obviously a school district, we don't use 3000 accounts. We don't have public safety accounts. Cities and counties will have those. Counties have health departments. Counties will have the 4000s. I don't use 4000s. Transportation, we do have transportation. Um, so you'll, you'll, you'll find consistencies across the board when you're looking at different types of governments. So transportation, Transportation would be like your um, your DPW highway. That would be transportation. That that category. And then when we get down to the object that we spoke about, um, the point one always going to be your personal services and wages. Um, then you're going to have your equipment and capital outlay is always your point two. Um, a lot of times these have really the three digits. Um, at least for us, I don't know, if John. That's true for you as well, we always have three digits. So instruction is like, in, um, when you go, if you looked back at that um, account code listing for school districts, a 150 is an instructional person. So that's an instructional step, but it always is gonna start with a 0.1. A 0.16 is non-instructional. So there's, there's still kind of further um, descriptions across the board when you look at um, the objects, but these are always kind of the, the point, the first digit is what these, um, identify. Yeah, we um we've done it where um we'll use um we'll have point point one zero and point one one will be we'll keep a separate line item for both judges. 
and we might have a an overtime line and so you have a lot of flexibility on what you can do depending on how detailed you want to keep track of your records um again um you have a lot of flexibility in this area on uh, what to do uh, if you want to keep track of overtime separately you want to have a separate overtime account and that's really a good idea so you do these object codes give you um, a lot of flexibility and most of you will only be using 0 0.1 0 0.2 0 0.4 in fact some of you may only be using 0 0.2 and 0 0.4 because 0 0.1 um, you're only going to really be involved in that if you're really a bookkeeper um, doing the payroll function. And then the other ones are, are more the debt and the benefit codes. So, yeah. Yeah, and I found over time, like, it depends on, there's a risk always. There's sometimes you can get too carried away with creating too many different object codes. Um, so you could have, you know, 99 different 400 accounts. So you could have supplies, repairs, paper, paper clips staples so you, you can kind of get carried away with it um so it's really when as you're setting up your accounts initially and in, there's been times where i've kind of consolidated accounts and tried to get rid of some because i found that i'm getting too carried away with breaking things down but at the same time if there's things that you want to track specifically it is a good way to create an account and, and name it um, and then be able to always pull up that account and be able to track those over time So debits and credits, um, they're obviously the, the basis of everything we do in accounting. Um, and we're going to kind of go through the little T accounts. I, I've always loved my little T accounts with the balances um, to always just remember, you know, if it's a debit, if it's increasing or if it's a credit, it's decreasing, depending on whether it's an asset or liability. Um, our governmental funds, class, classifications, and we're going to go through the different types of funds here in a minute. I think what you'll notice, obviously, these are always going to be the accounts that you're going to have um, as your classifications with your governmental funds. And we always use um, the terms expenditures and fund balance and governmental funds. When you look at your proprietary funds, which are more of your business type funds, um, you know, you're looking at really your net position and you're going to look at expenses instead of expenditures. Um, and then when you look at your balance sheet equation, it's always going to be your assets plus your deferred outflows minus your liabilities is your fund balance or your net position. And then, so here's our little T accounts. Um, you know, the basis of what we've learned when, when we first went into accounting. Um, I still love them. So when you think about your assets and you're, if you're thinking about kind of your balance sheet, you always, I always picture my assets and my liabilities and my fund balance down here. Um, so when you look at your debits, your debits on your assets are gonna increase it. And whatever your, your positive sign is, that's kind of your, where your balance is. So you don't wanna have a negative cash balance or a negative asset. Um, so these are just really kind of the, the flow of how the debits and credits will change things and change your balance and whether they're gonna increase or decrease them. John, was there anything else we wanted to add on this slide? I can't remember when we talked about it. Yeah. Um, so I want I'm gonna give you a little history of debits and credits so you kind of understand because again, some of you have never been exposed to them before. So double entry, this is part of what is called double entry bookkeeping. Everything is now done for the most part on a computer. But double entry bookkeeping has been around for 500 years. It was founded uh, back uh, during the Renaissance. And the, the premise behind double entry bookkeeping is that basically um, for every debit you record, you also have to record a credit and they always have to be in balance. So it, in doing that, each category has a classification on what it would normally be. So assets and expenses normally get classified as debits. Liabilities, 
fund balance and revenues normally get classified as credits. And this table shows how these categories will either increase or decrease. So when an asset, you debit an asset if you want to increase it. So if cash goes up, we debit um, cash. If our liabilities go up, we credit our liabilities. So this chart is actually extremely useful when you're starting out to try to understand um, how um, accounting actually works. Yes, thank you. Yeah, this is one of those things that kind of I do always have kind of aside and especially when I'm working with newer accountants, um, I kind of go through this with them so that they remember um, what, what type of entry we're working on and how it's going to impact ultimately kind of our, our balance sheet and income statement. If anybody has any questions um, as we're going through this presentation, please feel free to ask us um, in the chat box and um, I'll be I'll, I'll be periodically checking them as Barb is presenting in this uh, first section. So please, um, if you got anything for us, ask us as we go through it. So fund accounting. So fund accounting is really um, the thing that sets governments kind of a way, it separates it from all other businesses and your general accounting that you probably learned in school or would think of as you're, as you're thinking about just kind of your everyday accounting and maybe even taxes. Um, fund accounting is definitely its own unique way of accounting for things. Um, I always, would, would, to new board members in particular, I talk a lot about, when I talk about funds, I, I try to get them to think about the different buckets. Um, our general fund is really our bucket that's for our operating expenditures. It's kind of where our state aid comes in. Um, when you think about our capital projects bucket, um, that's obviously where we might um, get some of our uh, resources for, from borrowings to pay for our capital project that we have going on. But the different thing that with fund accounting is that when you're going kind of between those buckets, you still have to account for those transactions in a very particular way. Um, so it's just, it's, it's trying to remember, um, it's almost, sometimes it's almost like double counting things when you're doing transfers between funds particularly. So if I'm transferring something from my general fund to my capital fund, it's a expenditure on my uh, general fund, a revenue in my capital fund. But really, I'm kind of overstate. When you think about it in fund accounting, you're almost overstating things. But that's how those buckets have to be presented. Um, that's just kind of how I try to remember it and kind of teach people that, you know, those are different, uh, totally different sets of accounts. Um, that you're you're tracking, and the hardest the hardest um, situations that I've run into dealing with a lot of smaller um, entities is if like if you start with a program like a Williamson Law Book, they actually are a government accounting uh, program, and they will separate the funds. But some of our communities. Um, use QuickBooks. And if you use QuickBooks, what you really have to do with government in, in saying what Barb was just talking about a minute ago, is you really have to set up a separate company for each fund. Like you can't just record all the funds as one company, or um, you will not be separating as Barb mentioned. So with some of the clients I work on that use QuickBooks, um, I help them with this by going in and separating um, each company as a separate fund. And then once you do this, you do really get the hang of it after a while and it does make sense. But when you're first doing this, it sounds really foreign. Yeah. And as you get into it, um, it is sort of a different animal, government accounting, but that's something you really have to keep in mind that every fund really has to be segregated. You cannot mix it with another fund. 
Yeah, and a lot of them, I mean, are there's there's reasons sometimes that they're legally separated. So that's where you definitely want to make sure you're kind of keeping each of your funds in its own self-balancing set of accounts um, and reporting it that way. Um, so you'll have grant funds. Um, you, you know, if you have kind of a special aid fund that have your grants are accounted for in, you're getting that money for a very specific purpose and you need to report back out on it in a very specific way. So you just always, again, I always just kind of go back to the buckets and try to think about you know, what was the intent of this money and where does it belong? And then how am I going to make sure that I'm, I have it in its own set of accounts? But as John said, so if you have your, your if your system's already set up, you should already have these designations. Um, sometimes there's confusion when people are trying to make entries between the funds, if they're borrowing money or they're doing transactions that are due to's and due from's, um, which I don't to get into that later, um, maybe next presentation, but when you're kind of going between funds, you will still have to make sure that you're balancing and you have a debit and credit in both funds. So I have seen kind of um, people try to just transfer between funds with, with only a debit and a credit, but one on, only one in each fund. So that's kind of one of the things that um, we used to work on as well. So these are your main types of funds, um, your governmental funds, um, those are the ones that you're you're going to use um, your modified accrual basis of accounting. So those are your general, your special revenue funds are the ones that have they'll have like your grants in there, your capital projects funds. Um, for school districts, we generally only have a capital projects fund when we have a capital one major capital project usually at a time. Um, for counties, they're going to have a capital projects fund that has a lot more activity. Um, your debt service fund, um, you don't always have to have a debt service fund, depending on if you have principal and interest, um, but even if you have principal and interest, you don't have to have a debt service fund, um, but it is where you would record any of your debt service reserves and then your payments to uh, on, your bar, on your bonds. And then we have permanent funds. Your proprietary funds, those are your, your business type activities. So you're going to have um, enterprise and internal service funds, which we do go through all of these here in a little bit uh, more detail. Fiduciary funds are kind of just what it says. I mean, they're really custodial funds that you're kind of um, holding in trust for, for a future purpose or for someone else's purpose. And then our supplemental schedules here, we talk about these just high level. Um, if some, some of your reporting out that we have to do with the state controller's office, um, and if you have your audits, you do have to talk, report your long-term liabilities and your capital assets. Um, capital assets, I think, is K. Is that the K fund, John? Yes. And your long-term liabilities is your W fund. That's correct. So governmental funds, um, may, these are the main ones I would say that you'll use. Uh, you'll, everybody's going to have a general fund. Um, that's really for all your transactions uh, that aren't really accounted for anyplace else. So they don't really necessarily have a specific funding source like a grant would. It's really just your day-to-day -day operations um, that are financed through your taxes or other general revenues such as state or federal aid. And I say federal aid loosely in the sense that it's not designated for a, a specific grant purpose. It's kind of general federal aid. Um, special revenue funds, they're related to a very specific revenue source. Um, they have to be legally restricted and the expenditures are really for specified purposes. So, so I'll, give you, I'll give you some other examples here. Um, if you're a town, um, street lighting districts would fall under this category. So if you have a street lighting district, um, it would be treated as a special revenue fund. And certain water districts can actually fall under this um, if you have a levy to pay the debt on your water project. So special revenue funds can actually be uh, quite, quite important as you're going through this, that there are, there are quite a few um, possibilities of using um, special revenue funds. But again, the ones, if you're a town, uh, the big one there would be um, a street lighting district. And then there's the proprietary funds that we touched on earlier. Um, those are really supposed to be self-supporting funds um, that services 
are rendered and then usually financed by a user fee um, or based on a cost reimbursement basis. So a lot of times you'll find a refuse district or a refuse um, program as a proprietary fund. Um, trying to, so then, and then the, there's two types of proprietary, ah, proprietary funds. We have our enterprise and our internal service funds. So enter, yeah, oh, there, there yep. it is, never mind. Okay. So our enterprise funds, um, they may be used for activities financed by user fees. So you would have to use an enterprise fund um, if the debt was secured by fees. The law or regulations required it to be covered by fees rather than taxes. And then the governing board's pricing policy establishes that fees should cover the cost of providing the services. Um, the, this applies to like the IDAs. Um, other examples would be like electric utilities. Um, hospitals would use these. So it's basically- Airports. Oh yeah, airports, good one. Um, so basically you're looking at trying to, you're financing your cost to a some type of fee. So you're not, you don't have the ability to levy a tax. So you, know, you don't know that you're always gonna be able to cover um, your costs. Internal service fund is a type of a enterprise or proprietary fund. So they account for the goods and services provided to other funds um, within the government. So a lot of times you'll see these mostly in probably a city or county. I can't think of, I don't know if an airport would have one. I don't know, would an airport have its own internal service fund, John? I don't think so. I, I think I, I, I think where you see this in some instances it is like the self insurance program. Yeah. So yeah. Self insurance is a big one. Yeah. The counties are, are generally speaking, counties have a, a self insured program. Um, and then uh, sometimes they'll have that kind of that central motor pool. Um, I've seen that in the city as well. Basically, they're not that, we don't have a lot of them. No, you don't see them very often. Fiduciary funds, these you will see a lot of, particularly as it rate, uh, relates to payroll deductions. So we always, generally, we always just call them our trust and agency accounts. So and then they've kind of changed the terms and they've changed what we can account in them. But it's truly as your fiduciary accounts, um, your fiduciary funds. So you really, if it, you're taking assets and you're holding them um, as a trustee. So it's either for kind of your individuals, your employees, um, or organizations. So when you think about payroll deductions and you're collecting the state and federal taxes when you, you're paying your staff, but you're not paying that state and federal tax maybe right away. So you're holding it in trust until it's time to send it out um, to the government. Um, that's true of garnishes, um, other payroll deductions that you may collect, union dues. So you're kind of holding them all in this fiduciary account and then the fiduciary funds until you pay them at a later date. So the major fund letter designation, um, going, kind of going backwards here, but the funds that we have, um, the general fund is always A. For your, when you have your, your general fund and you have your town and then you have your town outside your village, that's gonna be your uh, B fund. So that's only if a town contains a village. So that's not always gonna, you're not always gonna have that. And then in your, um, in your towns, your highway fund is your DA or your DB. And then your county road fund is your D fund. Road machinery is DM. Water is FX if it's a governmental fund. Your sewer fund is always your G fund. Again, if it's a governmental fund. H fund is always your capital projects fund. B is your debt service. Um, again, that accounts for kind of the accumulation of resources for your payment of your principal and long-term interest. Um, proprietary funds, again, this takes you back to that, um, the, the arm that I opened up at the beginning. You can look at that for your proprietary fund. And then your fiduciary funds um, that we were just talking about, 
your custodial funds um, is your, this is a new, new designation, TC. Um, this is where we used to call them the trust and the agency accounts, and now they've come out and, and changed their designation to be called custodial. Um, so that's your assets held by the government as an agent for individuals, organizations, or other governments and other funds. You can have private purpose trust funds. Um, as a school district, we do have those because we have um, people who have donated funds that they then want us to give scholarships to students. So we have some of those in our in our um, ledgers. Oops. Yeah, now it's got crazy. And then there's pension trust funds uh, for defined benefit pension plans. Um, we do not have any of those because we're a lot we're members of the um, state retirement system. I don't know, I, John. Do you have any anyone with pension trust funds at all? Maybe no. Fire, any fire I, districts? No, we do not. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Maybe I don't have any. Um. I don't have any clients that have low SAPs, but a low SAP might fall under that. A length of service awards program mm -hmm. that sometimes they're um, they're built into either towns or villages, and you see them in uh, in uh, fire uh, fire protection districts. Okay. Uh, as far as the, I can I can jump in and talk for a second about the um, custodial funds too. I can add a little. So uh, the Government Accounting Standards Board uh, recently came out with GASB 84. And when they came out with GASB 84, it created this new category called um, custodial funds. So if, if some of you were doing your annual update document, which we will get into later on, well, we have a couple of bookkeepers that are on the call today. You'll notice that with the latest version of the annual update document, um, they took out TA and they replaced it with TC. So a custodial is a brand new category and it represents um, assets that are um, held for somebody else. So you might be holding them for an individual, a private organization, and there's this is a brand new category. So what they've done is they've taken what used to be in TA, and you can still have a TA, but whatever is in the TA, you just have to report them usually as part of your general now. So in other words, you can still use TA in your records, but when you report it on your AUD, which is really what 84 is addressing, um, you just have to put those numbers inside of your general fund. Again, if some of you happen to run into that this year, like I did when I was filing some AUDs, it's really not a big deal. It's, it's a change that they made in reporting and it, if you ever hear GASB 84 that's what GASB 84 is yes yeah GASB is the government accounting standards board and they're an organization that sets the rules for government accounting and then these rules we end up ultimately having to learn them and we have to apply them to either our, our our jobs or our clients or ultimately we teach them and this was a, a brand new rule that just came out um this year so we're all sort sort of using it for the first time this year yeah and FASB is the one is for basically everybody except probably governments um and so governments follow the the G, the GASBs, um, and with the, the custodials, we we have to, our, you know, our auditors were required to change the way we're accounting for our custodial funds. So we're currently, right now, working with um, the school districts all use WinCap, which is our, our government accounting software. So we are in the process of all setting up the new funds um, and getting them all in place before June 30th, which is what our year end is. For our audit and everything so that's kind of coming through right now as we speak 
And I'll answer a question that came in from Maura. Um, GASB, the GASB rules apply to um, state and local governments. FASB rules apply to non-for-profits and regular business. So the, the GASB rules do pertain to everybody, I believe, on this call today. So they address uh, changes for sta all state and local governments in, um, in the U.S. Yep. Yep. GASB.org is the website. Yep. Does anyone have any specific questions or anything that they'd like us to touch on um, from the beginning section that, that we've gone through? Um, certainly, I'm happy to elaborate on anything. We have time for Q&A right now, so this is a good time. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything specifically related? And we, we built in the Q&A time into our presentation, so hopefully we, we can help you guys out if you have any particular questions. Yeah, I was just going to go, I thought maybe I could just, in looking at this, um, I'm trying to think if they showed more of the accounts here. I got a question that came in, um, Barb, let me read it, okay? Okay, yep. Do you recommend departmental accounting for villages? So, breaking it down into like your treasurer and... mayor's office or I guess to, to what I guess it would depend to what extent some of it is going to be driven by your account code structure mm -hmm. so it's automatically going to be divided um, yeah in a in a village oh, hold on. oh yeah yes okay follow-up question for oh. DPW police and oh. fire yes 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 there's codes set up uh, for villages already different codes for police and fire and mayor and treasurer and yes when you do put together your budget you should be using those codes and we don't really do we get into budget at all in this presentation or not really i, I don't think we do no okay we could i could probably take a couple minutes just to uh talk a little bit about so the the way that it would work is that when you're preparing your budget and some of you might use software but most of my small um, towns and villages do their budgets um, in excel and then they would take that information and then enter them in their accounting system um, you want to break it out in as much detail as the village or town board wants it to. But it's much easier to track it if you use the um, departmental information, especially when um, when you report it on the AUD, they're gonna want it be they're gonna want to have it reported um, if you have police, if you have fire, if you have highway. So what you do is when you put your budget together, you break it out on those categories. And then when you report it on the AUD, you already have those categories. Let's see. I think Maura, did you, I think we got a question on, to show the kind of the different buckets of funding. So that be our kind of our funds. Um, so this chart in the arm shows, you know, for each type of government entity, except school districts for some reason, but, um, this shows you what your different letters and types of real funding buckets um, and accounts that you'd have to report on, on for your fund purposes. Barb, can you do me a favor? We have a uh, we have a question, and 
Could you go to the query in the general fund for a second? The question is, where in the general fund do we put our trust and agency balances on the AUD if we aren't going to report under TC? Um, we're going to show you in the query. Because in the new query, they actually set up accounts for you right in the general fund. They're um, 600 liability accounts. So we're going to show you. So you'll see some of the, um, there's 700 accounts. There you go, right there, Barb. Yep. So the accounts that you would normally put before in trust and agency, they show up in the general fund and you can see there are 700 accounts. So you'll see deferred compensation, disability insurance, group insurance, association and union dues. Um, these were all, these all used to be um, in your T and A, and now they were moved over to the general. So that's where you report them now. And I had to do this for um, five of the communities I filed AUDs for this year. So that's where you actually record them now. So no, no more TA in, um, on the AUD, it's part of the general fund here. And there are 700, most of them are 700 codes. Okay. okay, so we answered those questions. Yep. Let's see if there's any more. All right, so you answered the bucket question. Yep. Okay. And we answered that question. Okay. Oh yeah, we could. Yeah, we could ask that, Maura. Yeah. Uh, maybe asking people um, about their um, kind of accounting system that they use. Yeah. If people want to enter it in the in the chat. If they know what their accounting system is, if they're using QuickBooks or they don't know, or they're, they may not know some people. Okay, so admins, okay. All right. All right. Okay. KVS, okay, through Springbrook, okay. I haven't heard of admins. Admins um, bought out BAS. Oh, okay. So yeah, BAS is what a lot of the clerks use. Yep, okay. And about a year ago, they bought them out. Yep, New World. I'm familiar with New World. Um, our county uses New World here. Okay. Okay, yeah. So it looks like most people do have um, actual government accounting systems. So that makes it actually a lot easier. Yes. Yes, it is. That's good. That is good. Because then we can kind of cater what we're doing going forward with that knowledge. Right. Okay. I think. Uh, Great. Yep. All right. I think we're going to take a 10 minute break. Yep. So we'll all meet back at three o'clock. I'll stop my share, right, John, so you can share. Yeah, do you want me? Yeah, can I? I, I can click if you want, or it's up to you. Yeah, just leave it up there, because we're, right, not... we're both partaking in it. That'll be easier. Yep, perfect. All right. Okay, I will be back in a couple minutes. I'm just dismissing the questions right now. I'm just cleaning oh, okay. them up. Okay. Yeah. 
because we already an we answered all the questions. Yep. So now we got a clean slate. So all right. So we get rolling in another minute or two. Two fifty nine, Mara says. Yep, I got my phone. <laughs> I'm getting ready to hit the start button. So okay. For two fifty for the fifty minutes for the <laughs> alarm. Okay, and you can either I'll kind of go with the flow and change the. I'll kind of know when you're gonna. Go on and you jump hour. you jump in like I jumped in in the yep. first hour. Yeah. Helps mix it up a little bit. It does. And then and I ended up having a lot of questions, so that was good. Yeah. Okay, we're going to um get started now with the second hour. All right. Uh, once again, if you all have any questions, uh, we don't really care. Um, one of us will, you know, watch the chat in the Q&A, and then we'll just convey the questions like we were doing in the first hour. It, it doesn't matter. They're both um, on the bottom of our screens. So um, I'm going to be um, leading the second hour today of this discussion, and then um, as I'm as I'm talking about things, Barb will jump in sort of like I did in the first hour. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the um, accounting process in this next hour. So uh, we start with, uh, this is a lot of the definition stuff that you go through uh, in a basic accounting class, the measurement focus and the basis of accounting. And again, we we hear um, about the difference between what a modified accrual system is versus a full accrual. And in in governmental accounting, in the governmental funds, um, we use um, what is called modified accrual. So we'll get into these momentarily. So. Um, Basically, um, we have what are called measurement focus and the basis of accounting. That's really where the differences lie. So what is measurement focus? Simply stated, it's what um, is measured and reported in your fund uh, financial statements, just referred to as measurement focus. The basis of accounting refers to the determination of when a transaction or event is recognized in the funds. And, and I will tell you that in some instances, but not all instances, uh, modified accrual accounting treats things differently than full accrual accounting. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So, governmental funds, such as the general fund, use what is called modified accrual accounting. And I'll, I'll read it to you, and then I will jump in and kind of explain it to you. So, Revenues are not recognized until measurable and available. So why don't we step back even one step further, right? And we didn't do this in the first hour. We, we, we made an assumption, but let's step back even and let's just find out what's an asset. What's a liability, what's revenue, and what's an expenditure? So typically, assets are things that we um, own. So we own a building, we own vehicles. Liabilities are things that we owe. 
we owe somebody money, account payable and note payable. Um, typically, a revenue is an inflow from, it could be from, in our case, from taxes, uh, fines and fees are a big one, sales state tax, what, what else? State aid. State aid. Um, building permits, dog licenses, there's a lot of ways to generate um, money coming in. But basically, that's what revenues are. Revenues are basically, in, in the broadest sense, they're inflows. Okay? Expenditures, on the other hand, are outflows. So we have to pay our employees. We have to pay our insurance. We have to buy salt. We have to buy... Um, Gasoline for the trucks. Uh, we have to pay our benefits, health insurance, retirement. These are all outflows. So depending on whether you use modified or full accrual, these inflows and outflows might have different treatment. So again, if you didn't really understand what a revenue and what an expenditure is, maybe now like you have a better grasp of them, and the term, term expenditure, we tend to use that, and it has something to do with legal authority to spend. So as opposed to the word expense, it, it has something to do with what Barb had talked about in the first hour. You have legal authority, and that legal authority allowing you to spend really falls under the auspices of expenditures. So you have tax money coming in and how that money is used, um, it can be restricted and that is really um, use of the word expenditure. So in, in theory, an expense and an expenditure are really the same thing, but in practice they're really not because you see expenses when you use um, uh, proprietary fund enterprise funds use um, the term expenses. Uh, governmental funds use the term expenditure. So what exactly is an expenditure? They are recognized in the period in which a liability is first incurred rather than when the liability is liquidated. Okay. Which Liquidation just means spent. Okay, so when your liability is liquidated, that means that you've taken care of it. You've paid the payables. You've paid the um, principal on the on the uh, note or whatever. It can it can be many different things. Okay, full accrual on the other hand. Just, I was just checking the chats. Uh, full accrual is um, the definition that if you sat in a basic accounting class um, that I teach in, because I, I focus in my regular accounting class on accounting for regular business, you would learn that, um, I'll, I'll correct this just slightly, um, revenues are recorded when earned with an E, and expenditures or expenses are recognized when incurred, okay? So in a full accrual setting, um, revenues are recognized when earned, all right? So in other words, we don't, we're not worried about measurable and available. All right, so when you earn it, you record it. And again, we, we can get into some examples about this um, later on so you have a, a better handle. Right now, we're just doing some definitions. Cash basis, we, um, we don't really deal with cash basis uh, in government accounting, but you all do when you file your individual taxes. So typically when you file taxes, we use a cash basis. 
We recognize transactions or events when the related cash amounts are received or dispersed. Um, tax deadline was Monday because they extended it a month. So um, when you file your tax returns, it's cash basis. Any any questions? Um, anything to add, Barb? Mm, no, nope. I was going to give the tax um, example and you gave it up for me. So. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. <laughs> So on the next page, um, this just once again, uh, this this is a very useful slide. Uh, so governmental funds, are there more or less resources that can be spent in the near future as a result of events and transactions of the period with a proprietary fund? Is the fund better or worse off economically as a result of events and transactions of the period? And um, again, modified, accru modified accrual uses the terminology flow of current financial resources. Proprietary funds, which remember are enterprise funds and internal service. So again, if you want to think of an enterprise fund, maybe on a local level, maybe um, you have a local um, electric utility. If you got a local electric utility, they're probably an enterprise fund. Okay? So you could see how do they operate. Okay? They're fee-based. Okay? You don't pay taxes for that electric utility, it's all fee-based. You get a, a bill every other month or you get a bill every quarter and that's how they um, operate. So they're basically, in essence, they're operating like a business. So they're gonna use a uh, full accrual, flow of economic resources. If we go to the next line, um, governmental, oh. Oh, no. I thought you said next slide, sorry. No, next line. Oh. Uh, governmental funds increase in spendable resources, uh, so it's revenue or other financing sources. And again, we can get into some of those a little later on, what those constitute. Uh, proprietary funds, events and transactions that improve economic position. So those would be revenues and um, gains. All right, so maybe you had some investment gains, things like that. Uh, the last section, governmental funds, decrease in spendable resources. What are these? And these would be expenditures and other financing uses. So now I can give you an example. Uh, an other financing source could be a transfer in. So if you had an interfund transfer, if one fund transferred money to another, that would be an example of an other financing source. And that's, it's not classified as a revenue, but it's treated like a revenue when you do your reports. Uh, other financing use, of course, would be a transfer out. And that would be the same rationale. Uh, over on the proprietary fund side, events and transactions that diminish economic position, um, those would be expenses, and that shouldn't be loses, that should be losses. All right? So if you sell something and you have a loss, that would be treated just like an expense. So that, that should be expenses or losses. L-O-O-S-E-S. -O -O -E Anything to add there, Barb? Um, no, I was just going to say, so when you when you do have to file like your AUD and your financial reports, it kind of goes without saying, but sometimes we classify things incorrectly when we're doing our transfers in and transfers out. So when you think about your other financing sources, it's kind of a self-reconciliation at the end of the year is always make sure you go back and make sure that all of your transfers in between your funds and your transfers out equal. Um, otherwise, you'll get an added exception when you file your reports. Yes. And, and when you do the AUD, 
you always want to run those edits. And you, you, your goal, of course, is to have zero edits if you can. Now, sometimes there are edits that you just can't get rid of. And what I have done is I've called OSC and give them a heads up before I file, just to let them know. But um, one, oh, are we later on, are we going to talk about, um, do we talk about treatment of capital assets in debt later on in this slide? Or do we I do that next week? I think we do that in the next one, in the next presentation. Oh, okay. I'll hold you off on that then. I think so, yep. Okay. Thanks, Mara. Yep. Okay. Next slide. Because I don't want to steal any thunder for next week. Okay. <laughs> so modified accrual. Now, what we'll be doing now is we'll delve down now into really what measurable and available is. All right, and they give you the um, the really good example would be the one with deferred revenue. So, um, governing board should define the period of time to be used, and it should be applied consistently from year to year. So, revenues are measurable and available. What does that typically mean? We're going to receive them within 60 to 90 days. And some are going to use a full year, such as state or federal revenue. Measurable but not available is deferred revenue. All right. So then we would receive current year for subsequent years. So just, just so you know that um, deferred revenue is treated um, as a liability. So if you're using modified accrual and you have an item and it's classified as deferred revenue, we would record it as revenue in the following year. Uh, some of you may have run into an issue this year, um, and I was going crazy this year with um, how to treat uh, chips. So I'm sure I was not the only one. Uh, you would spend your chips, and then the state decided that they were going to withhold 20% of the chips money last year, and then they changed it, and then it was 5%, and, um, and I don't know how many of you recorded that. Uh, I did uh, record it. I ended up recording it as a deferred inflow um, because there was uncertainty, because it was measurable but I didn't really know when it was available. So I think if any of you went through that last year with chips, um, you either spent 80% and maybe didn't have to worry about it and relied on it being carried over, or like most of my clients, they spent 100% and they had me deal with the ramification. Like we spent 100%, I haven't gotten the other 20%, how are we going to treat it? That's a very good example of this. Any questions on that? No question. I don't see any questions. Okay. You know, yeah, and that, I think you. that's a very good, um, timely example. Did now? Did the schools run into that too with state aid last year? Well, yeah. So we had um, monies that they would that they said they were going to withhold. Um, and we don't get, we kind of have that big 90 day window because for our year end is June 30th. And then we don't get a lot of our stuff until the end of September. So we had booked um, amounts as receivable and then they said they were gonna keep it. So we ended up recording it um, as deferred. And then when they sent it back to us this year, now we have more revenue than we anticipated in this fiscal year. Yeah. and I. I changed it. Um, I had initially recorded it at 20%. And then I got a letter before I closed my year end saying it was 5%. So I reduced it down to 5%. But I'm going to have the same problem this year. Yeah. Um, the money's coming in and I'm going to be recording an extra 5% of revenue. Yeah, the timing of it was tough because we were trying to get done. It was, the, it was kind of a last minute decision by the auditors because it was September and that's when they came out and said they were going to take it. So, yeah, we're, we're all kind of having that issue. 
And not only did they give us more of that, they gave us that money back. They increased all the chips money significantly this year. So it's, it's off. By the way, uh, again, I know I have some highway people here. Uh, when I refer to chips, it's the um, money New York State gives. Um, I believe it stands for Consolidated Highway Improvement Program. And it's money that highway superintendents use primarily to um, fix roads. And again, there was some uncertainty uh, with the state budget and COVID last year. So this was a front and center issue on uh, modified accrual. So again, if you, if, you, if you didn't really know deferred revenue and modified accrual, a lot of smaller communities got to know all about it last year. So this is a great timely example. Now, expenditures are recognized when a liability um, is incurred. So that one is pretty straightforward. All right, if you have an established liability, we can record it as an expenditure. Um, some examples of expenditures, um, debt, principal, and interest. So under modified accrual, this is kind of strange. We um, record as an expenditure both principal and interest in the fund that's paying for it. All right, so if the general fund is responsible for uh, principal and interest, you budget it and then it gets charged that line item as an expenditure. That one is sort of the oddball one here. All of the other ones are regular line items that a regular business would have. Salaries and payroll, utilities, health insurance. Um, the one you gotta be careful about is year end obligations. Um, I know I'll jump ahead, but when I do year end close in the um, town of Corning, I tell all the employees that we have to create two abstract piles at year end. Now the abstracts usually are numbered one to 12. An abstract is just, we're gonna get into this. It's a document that has all of the bills. But in order to do proper year end recording, um, you have to do an extra abstract that picks up bills that wanna be charged in the prior year. So and some of you may call it different things. If you're a village, you might call it a warrant. If you're a town, it's called an abstract, but usually you wanna have an extra one to pick up your year-end obligations. And again, when you do year-end close, it's, it's, it can be a little adventurous sometimes, but again, you wanna make sure things are coming out of the right year when you do this. So that's really what they're talking about here. I th oh, all right. Are we done? Yeah, we are. Okay. Okay. Now, did you want to take the purchase order system here, Barb, and I'll do the voucher system? Sure. Um, so most of you, I, I'm not as familiar with some of your systems. I don't know even if, if you could answer in the chat um, whether you use a purchase order system. So your purchase order system. Well, now, why don't we do that quickly, Barb? Yeah. Let's do that quickly. If you guys can, um, in the chat, if you're using a purchase order system or a vouchering system, that would be wonderful. So just say one or the other, or you don't know. Three answers. If you can do that in the chat. Okay, so we got purchase order. Mm -hmm. All right. Voucher, voucher. Okay. Do you all? Okay. So it looks like it's about, it's going to probably be about half and half. Good. Okay. Good. So the purchase order system um, really begins with a requisition. And so as long as you're using an automated accounting system um, and people can enter, at least, you know, with our system and our setup, we set up 
so that people have access to their own accounts. Um, and it may be different in your government, but if I, if I have access to my business office account, I can enter a requisition and it encumbers the funds. And the advantage of a purchase order system by encumbering the funds is that it really holds them there and kind of takes them out of availability from your budget. So we have a, a, an example of a report here in a couple of slides that will kind of show you what that looks like. So if my budget is $1,000 and I enter a requisition for 300, now I only have 700 available. So that kind of that requisition holds that money until such time as it moves and I, after I've encumbered it and issued the purchase order. So the requisition starts the process and then you actually is, issue like a physical purchase order and then that would be provided to your vendor um, for your to, to issue or to re request your purchase. So say it was $300 worth of supplies. So my purchase order encumbers those funds until at the time I get to take delivery of the supplies and I get my invoice and then I would pay against that purchase order. So then that moves kind of the, the amount from an encumbrance to an expense when I pay it. Um, but that's how it kind of holds the system as part of kind of a, it, it really does help your budgeting process and your system um, if you're using a purchase order system. Okay, I'll explain the vouchering system now. So, and I want to stress this to you when I say this, okay? Because if you have an audit done by OSC, they will, um, they will bring this up to you. If you're using a vouchering system, we have to make an assumption. That assumption is that you are following the um, organization's procurement policy. That's an assumption that we make ahead of time. So if you have the authority to go out and buy something for $1,000, you don't really need approval for it. You just go out and you buy it. If your procurement policy says you can do it, you do it. Okay. So in, in the case of a vouchering system, you just go out and buy something. And then the invoice comes in. And then you enter it in your system. And they're pre-numbered. They have to be. And then what ends up happening is the vouchers end up being approved then by the board. And then after that, then you can just cut the checks on it. And again, we have samples of documents both for a purchase order system and a voucher system. A voucher system is much easier to use and it's good for smaller entities. I personally like the PO system for larger entities because it puts in another layer of protection. But a lot of people can get away with vouchering systems if they're small enough. Okay. okay. Yeah, just elaborating on the encumbrances, um, it's, it is the money that you've obligated for your anticipated costs. So the, when, I, when I show you kind of the report on the next page, um, you'll kind of be able to see um, what that looks like. And then also, uh, I know we added this, so carryover from a prior year budget. So in your modified accrual accounting and your budget and the way that your budgetary accounts are, at that year end, I had issued a purchase order in anticipation of receiving something, but I haven't received it at the end of the year. My open purchase order will carry over into the next fiscal year and it automatically increases my budget by that PO amount. So that then when I get that item, whether it be three months later, or whenever it arrives and my invoice shows up, I am then can pay against that PO and I'm not utilizing the current year's budgetary funds. I'm using the prior year's budgetary funds that carried over in a purchase order. And then the reserve for encumbrances um, you'll see on your balance sheet um, and that's going to restrict a portion of your fund balance related to those carryover encumbrances. So basically, because you're increasing your budget in the following year with that carryover purchase order, you also have to reserve your fund balance because it's not available. It's being used, it's anticipated to be used for those purchase orders in the following year. 
So this is the report. I can't really make it any bigger, but I don't think I can make it bigger. No. Um, so you'll see, so here's your functions. And I know it's small, I apologize. So these are all of the different functions that we kind of talked about earlier. So Board of Education, District Clerk. Um, but I wanted to show you, so even we encumber our um, salaries as well, which I also find is a very good budgetary control. When you encumber all your salaries at the beginning of the year, it automatically will hold all the amounts. So you can see if, if you're in a, in, a, in a place that maybe changes positions or people move positions and you're encumbering their salaries, if you hire someone with a higher salary or if someone leaves and you hire someone with a less salary, you'll be able to automatically, oh, that's right, Maura. I don't know where to go though, it's over here. There it is. Ooh, all right, that's better, maybe. There. Yeah. there you go. There we okay. go. All right. Thanks, Mara. I couldn't remember. I had to click on it. Um, so when you're, when you're encumbering salaries, as opposed to just your purchase order, it helps you to monitor throughout the year if you have staff moving between positions. Um, but these would be adjust. This is kind of the categories here. Just to show you, you know, this was the initial budget. When we look at the adjustments um, and you look at we don't have the total down here, but you can tell if the adjustments column is above zero, that means I had carryover encumbrances from a prior year, because otherwise any of my budget adjustments would balance to zero. And so these would, our current appropriation then is just the initial plus our adjustments. That's what we've spent. And then these are all the encumbrances outstanding. And you can tell that we're definitely encumbering salaries, because when you look at teaching regular school and you see encumbrances of a million eight, that's certainly not just purchases. It's not just purchase orders. It does include salaries, um, but it gives you a good way to monitor um, what you have basically spoken for both between purchase orders and salaries. Oh, can you, I got to jump in for one second. Uh, so just so you know this, the word appropriation, appropriation just means what you budgeted. So an appropriation is a budgeted amount and your expenditure is what you actually spent. So hopefully you spend less than what you budgeted, but that's what the word appropriation means. It's, it's uh, you, when, you, when you budget revenues, they're called estimated revenues. When you budget expenditures, the budget is called an appropriation. So you, those terms that, but and in an accounting system, the modules all can be slapped together where you could see the appropriations and the expenditures on one schedule and it's great. And that's how you get your um, that's how you get your monthly budget to actual. This is most department is this could be a great tool for any department if you ever wanted to see um, what your you know where you stand kind of with your expenditures and your budget. Um, we're happy to always share those with other departments. I obviously look at it regularly um, for the district. So I love these reports. Me too. Oops. Now can I click on this one too? Ooh, there's your voucher, John. All right. Okay. So this is a sample of a voucher uh, for a bill that's uh, going to NYSEG. All right, so what happens is the NYSEG bill comes in, and um, you'll see on the top right corner, you'll see that the system, and we use um, the program that generated this voucher is Williamson Law Book. So it generates a pre numbered voucher. So this is voucher 141. Okay? So you'll see that this was entered on abstract number three, which is dated 31621. You can see that on the bottom of that box in the top right. There you go. And um, th these are different NYSEG bills. So if we take the first line item, um, we use, uh, we have a special code. A1620 is buildings. And 
we created for contractual 0.42, that's our um, town hall utilities only. So you'll see that under, dis under description, that, that shows what our account is called. So it's called town hall utilities only. So you'll see that we got a bill in for $399.98. So this has got a list of all of our NYSEG bills. We put them on one voucher. And then um, what we then do is um, the total of this is 320654. But if you go up top again, if you go up top again, because I think I... I want you to follow this uh, SW3 number, this 34159. We're going to follow that over to the next sheet, which is a sample of our abstract. So you can see how the voucher uh, goes into the abstract. Do we have another sheet there, Barb? I don't think so. Oh, is it page, down page? Oh, there you go. There it is. Okay, it wasn't that one. It was actually this one. So, this is a copy of the abstract um, that gets approved by the board. So, you'll see that it's got the date of the audit, the number, the total claims on the abstract. And you'll see here that um, the NYSEG was for this street by street lighting district. So you'll see voucher 141 is there. The account was SL5 5182.4 for 7187. Now, the reason there's a check number in there was after this abstract gets approved, we go back in and then we process the checks. So this is an abstract that's been completed, and once this is done, it gets filed in the town clerk's office. So you'll see this is a completed um, abstract. So there's really three steps. Step number one is um, you enter the vouchers. Step number two is you print the abstract initially, and then... Um, Step number three, you print it out to have it reviewed. So the board reviews the vouchers and they might review the abstract. And then after the board approves them, you go back in and then you cut the checks. And that's how a vouchering system works. Are there any questions on a vouchering system or a PO system? So, and then you can see that um, SL5, it's on here. That's 71. Yep. Um, the, the automation part uh, comes from the generation of the abstract. So you have to enter the vouchers in the system. And once you enter the vouchers, the abstract is, it, they automatically go to the abstract. That's correct. Yes. So you would enter the voucher, you would print this out, and then you would staple it um, to the bills. That's how the process works. Yeah, and the one other thing, I wanted to make sure that you all understand this. Uh, we've really been throwing out the word fund balance, but I want to make sure all of you really understand what fund balance is. And I'll, I'll just give you a very simple example. If you're used to regular um, business accounting, um, you may know it as, and they're not identical, but for simplicity's sake, I want to use it as a comparison. You may know it as retained earnings. So in government accounting, we don't have retained earnings. And in the governmental funds, we call it fund balance. And basically, I'll give you a very simple example. 
if you have um, $1,000 of assets and you have $500 of liabilities, then um, that means that your fund balance would be $500. So if you want to get your arms around what fund balance is, that's what fund balance is. All right, if you, if you forget about deferred inflows and outflows for a minute and can just think about it, that's what fund balance is. Are there any questions on that? Because I these are things that we um, probably should have brought up earlier and now we're bringing them back in because now we're getting into and we're seeing these terminologies. And remember, this is an intro class. So our assumption is walking in here that we if you know something about accounting great but you should be able to listen to us and if you don't have any knowledge in accounting hopefully you can understand what we're saying and if not please ask us questions okay so on this particular slide um this is interfund transactions and an interfund transaction, as the name implies, it's transactions between two different funds. So a water fund doing business with a sewer fund. Okay? So the most common type of interfund transaction is do to's and do from's. And you could also have receivables and liabilities as well. But the most common are do to's and do from's. So just so you know this, a because this can be very confusing. A do from is an asset. A do to is a liability. So if you have a do from in your accounting records, that means somebody owes you money. If you have a do to, that means you owe somebody money. And as Barb was saying a few minutes ago, if you file your AUD, you have to make sure that anything that's inter fund must balance. And Luckily, most accounting softwares do this for you automatically and not in, as, in terms of running balancing schedules. So like Williamson Law Book, they actually have an interfund um, uh, sheet that you can print out to make sure that you're in balance. Okay. And again, um, let me point out, OSC has guidelines that um, interfund loans must be paid back by the end of the fiscal year. It's their guidance. Now, I, I'm not sure if they've changed a little bit of that guidance because of COVID, because there were some things that were changed, yeah. but I can certainly look into that. Barbara, any thoughts yeah, on they, that? Or? I think they've alleviated some of that. Um, because particularly when they were talking about the 20% reductions of state aid, but they they did approve, I'm pretty sure, the legislation that allowed um, for borrowing of reserve funds. Yep, it was extended to next year, Fred said. Yes, so, okay, thank thing, you, Fred. Yeah, thanks, Fred. I would add to, I know they say that it has to be paid back by the end of the fiscal year, but if you work with your auditors too, it's never, it's not necessarily always gonna be paid back at the end of the year, because you might have kind of a, a year end transaction that you're you're going to have a do to do from at the end of the fiscal year because it's cash it's it's cash so if at june 30th you owed it it's not like you can backdate it and say that you didn't owe them the cash at the end of your fiscal year i think it's more of a, if it's at a reasonable period of time a lot of times what you'll find particularly when it's grants if your grant funds haven't received the cash they're going to be in a deficit so you'll have to borrow the money from your general fund for your grants until the money comes into you from the the state or federal government because you had to submit a claim to get that 
that cash back. So there's 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 definitely possibilities where you could have balances due to each other at the end of the fiscal year, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. And that also happens. Um, that happens if you're um, if you're in the process of doing a water district, and um, you're required to spend money out, and you haven't formed that water district, and you haven't gotten any funding in but yet you had to shell out money for the engineers. It's gotta come from somewhere. Yeah. So you would initially charge an operating fund and you would show a do to and a do from in the capital fund after the project's been approved. And in some instances, it may take two or three years. But again, if, if, if what'll happen in situations like that, and it's happened with me and my clients, is you'll get an email from OSC and they're very nice and they'll just send hey you know I noticed this can you tell me what's going on and if you explain that situation they will they will just give you a pass normally on it so I think um, you know you have situations where you might have a lot of money in one fund less money in another and maybe you'll do a lending between funds it's a heck of a lot cheaper than going out and and having an FA and uh, going out and borrowing. So you might, um, we did one of these where um, a machine was bought and uh, we didn't enter fund lending. It was, it, it, you know, you're basically borrowing from yourself. So there are exceptions in this area. So I think you, our rule is kind of, the, it's gotta be a little bit flexible in this area. And if you're uncertain, you can always call them on the phone because they're really good to talk to. Any questions? Okay. So let's um, do this example. Okay. Let's do this example. So we record a, a loan to water fund from the general fund. All right. So we're lending money the general fund is lending money to the water fund. All right, so the general fund is, I'm gonna correct this just slightly. Oh, it's okay, it's actually okay. Yeah, okay. So the general fund will record due from other funds or due from water fund, same thing, credit cash, the water fund is going to receive the 45000 so they're going to debit cash because it's going to go up, and then they're going to credit a liability account called due to general fund or due to other funds for 45000 So you see how it gets recorded separately in both funds? That's how you would record um, a due to and due from. Next slide. Sometimes you have an interfund service. So these are a little different because one entity <laughs> records revenue and one entity records an expenditure. So in our example here, the village DPW performs sewer line repair. So next slide, please. On this, I would just tell you, um, this is one of the areas where you can get kind of mixed up on your reporting because one fund tends to record it as a transfer out as opposed to an expenditure and one will record it as a revenue as opposed to a transfer in. So if they're truly services being performed, they're truly revenues and expenditures that are not classified as transfers in and out. That's where I've kind of seen the mistakes is one will be a transfer in and one's the expenditure, but it's not in the right category. So that's just kind of a, a little tidbit there to look for. If your transfers in and out aren't correct, it may have something to do with one of these interfund services. Yeah, and that's a good point because these are actually legitimate revenues and expenditures. Yeah, like we these charge are... indirect costs. So if you use indirect costs um, and charge like your grant funds, that's an example of where that's a true revenue to the general fund and a true expenditure to the grant but it's not classified in those 5,000 and 9,000 accounts as a transfer in and out. It's a, it's a recorded expenditure and revenue. So in this example, in the general fund, 
the general fund would charge the storm sewer account twenty thousand dollars so that's an expenditure so we debit it because we're charging it and they're going to credit cash for twenty thousand because our cash will go down because we're sending our cash over to the sewer fund the sewer fund is going to increase its cash by twenty thousand and it's going to charge um, a revenue account called um, interfund revenues for twenty thousand, and that's um, I we when we look this up, it's a twenty eight oh one. All right. So a, another um, example of an interfund transaction would be an expenditure that's made in one fund um, that should appropriately be charged to another fund. So in our example, um, a utility bill gets paid by the general fund and then a portion gets charged to the water fund. So these are called reimbursements. So the general fund pays a utility bill for $7,500. So once again, we're going to charge the building contractual a $1620.4, And since our cash goes down, we'll credit cash $7,500. And the water fund is responsible for 4,500 of this bill. So um, we're going to um, go to the water fund. They're going to charge FX 8320.4, They're going to credit cash 4,500 and they're gonna send that cash back to the general fund in the general fund records a second entry debiting cash 4500 and then crediting the a1620.4 for $4500 hence the net cost to the general fund on this is $3000 that's why in this case a reimbursement would reduce the expenditure account because it's not a true expenditure for the full amount. So the general fund is only liable for 3000 The water fund is liable for 4500 Yeah, that's a good point, John, is that you're reducing your expenditure. It's not a revenue from the water fund because you don't want to have the expenditures overstated in the general fund and then overstate the revenues because you're getting a reimbursement. You really want to make sure you're reducing your expenditure. Another um, example would be an operating transfer. And this is a cash transfer without requirement for repayment. Um, sometimes these are also called permanent transfers. Yes. Yeah, that would make sense, uh, Roxanne, to just charge um, to just charge the um, water fund for that utility. I think it depends. It, like, if you're if you had an accounting system that you could change the account that you charged it to, right? It's certainly easy to do that. I think sometimes if people have kind of already paid the made the payment and their accounting software is less sophisticated then you could just do a reimbursement to the the general fund and sometimes you may not know this and it comes up after the fact right so maybe you pay for two people to go to a conference and then maybe uh, one person can't make it another person goes and they're from another department but it was already paid so then you would go back and then do a reimbursement now, um, these, these are um, what are called permanent transfers. So a special revenue fund uh, contributing toward a playground by the general fund. All right. 
So um, what we would do here is the accounts that we would use, the revenue account we would use is um, 5031, which is um, interfund transfers and um, expenditures are also interfund transfer. One is a revenue interfund transfer and one is an expenditure interfund transfer. Uh, okay, yeah, here, here's a example, okay. So we uh, complete a capital project uh, and we have extra money left over and we're transferring that money back to the general fund. Maybe it was money that was not used. So say it's $10,000. So we would transfer the money out of the capital project fund and then that money would go into the general fund as an inner fund transfer, okay? But in these cases, these are permanent transfers. Uh, you still do have to balance them out when you do the AUD. That's another um, check and balance on the AUD that you might get an edit for. Even though they're permanent transfers, inner fund transfers in and inner fund transfers out must equal. Okay, even though they're permanent, they still have to equal. Any, any questions on that? Okay. Any questions uh, from the audience at all? We've got a couple minutes left before we end it. No, you all want to get outside and enjoy the 80 degree weather. So do I. Oh, permanent. Yeah, permanent means um, permanent means that you don't pay it back. It's not a do to and a do from. It's a permanent transfer. And some of these can actually be budgetary. You can build in a permanent transfer in your budget if you know you want to send money to another fund during the year. Especially but they're not, do twos and do froms have to get paid back. Permanent transfers do not. If you have That's your capital question. reserves in your general fund and you know you have a project that you're sending your, your money over from the general fund, that would be a, a permanent transfer as well. You're going to transfer the money out from your reserve fund in the general fund. It'll be an expense to the general fund and a revenue to the capital which is, I actually was talking about that kind of at the beginning because it does kind of overstate your total um, revenues and expenditures when you're counting it in two funds as a total government entity. Um, but that's the way you have to account for it when you're moving things between those buckets. And again, if you don't, when you file your, um, your AUD, um, it will uh, show up as an error when you're running your utility edits. And that's a good way to check. Because because that happened to me earlier this year, I was doing one and I had one mis misclassified and I got an edit and I'm like, oh, okay. I went back and I fixed it and I reclassified it and then I was fine. Okay. All right. We will see everybody um, next um, Wednesday for the second part of this. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your day. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the nice weather. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. And we will hopefully see you all next week. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thanks.